Hello everyone, Dr. Carlo Oyer, emergency physician. And in this patient education video, I will be answering the question of one of my viewers who says, uh, what is the difference between a rapid heart rate and atrial fibrillation? So this will become a video about cardiac arrhythmias, palpitations, and ultimately an explanation about atrial fibrillation. So the normal human heart rate should be somewhere about 60 to 100. Anything more than 100 is considered tachycardia or fast heart rate. Anything less than 6 is going to be bradycardia or low heart rate. Anything in between is considered normal heart rate. Now the rate relates to how synchronous or how uh, perfectly clockwork each beat is. So something that is sinus is go boom, boom in a perfect rhythm. Something that is non-sinus um, can be regular, but tends to be irregular. Sinus refers to the part of the heart that controls the heart rate. In other words, the computer chip in your heart that sends the signal down the heart to make the heart contract. In a normal heartbeat, the sinus lies in the upper part of your heart, sends a signal through the lower part of your heart, your ventricles, and then that signals the ventricles to contract, pump the blood out, and then relax. The next signal is sent, contract, relax, and so on. So you can have sinus tachycardia. In other words, the sinus is sending signals for the heart rate to go faster. This happens when you work out, when you get upset, when they have a fever and the body needs more blood flow. This is a normal response. And a sinus tachycardia can be anywhere from 100 beats per minute to usually about 150. It's not that you cannot have sinus tachycardia at 155, but then you have to start suspecting there's some other arrhythmia happening. So normal sinus tachycardia is between 100 and 150. Anything more than 150, then you think about other abnormalities in the rate, which we'll talk about next. Um, sinus bradycardia is when the signal is too slow and it's less than 60. Now, again, this is still sinus, so it's still regular heart beats. So now let's talk about the tachycardias. Tachycardia means heart rates that are just too fast. We already talked about the sinus tachycardia, and now we're going to talk about the arrhythmias. And one of the most common will be atrial fibrillation. And that stands for the atrium, the top part of your heart, is fibrillating. In other words, it's beating like this. Not really contracting like it's supposed to, but it's going like that. That's because the sinus or the top part of the heart is it's going crazy. It's having a convulsion of electricity and the ventricles trying to catch up. Usually this is an irregular rhythm. It could look regular at times, but most of the time it's very irregular. So, so but, and it's very fast, somewhere about 150 or more, but sometimes up to 10 to 20. What happens when the heart beats like that is it becomes inefficient. The pump doesn't actually pump all the blood out and cause the blood to kind of lay around on the heart too long, causing small micro clots to form, which can then lead to the heart pumping these clots into the circulation, causing potentially a stroke, causing an arterial emboli uh, to your extremities or leg, causing pulmonary embolism and other problems that are not good. And because the heart loses what is called the atrial kick, the atrium really is not contracting well at all, especially older people can get really lightheaded and dizzy and weak. What happens in healthier people who have atrial fibrillation is that the heart becoming inefficient, then they can overexert their heart and overexerting the heart for a prolonged period of time will lead to heart ischemia. It's almost like you're working the heart too much. So you can actually cause non-obstructive uh, myocardial infarction. That means just like an overuse. The, the heart got stressed so much because some microinfarctions or even bigger infarctions because the heart rate going so fast. So the first thing in atrial fibrillation is to decrease the heart rate, to slow it down, to allow the heart to rest and to become more efficient. The second will be cardioversion, where you're trying the heart to go back to normal rhythm. Problem is, when a patient is in atrial fibrillation and you don't know how long or it's been more than 48 hours, those clots we're talking about have already formed or might have formed, therefore cardioverting or putting the patient back into normal rhythm would result in sending these clots out to the periphery. 
So in a person who we don't know when it started, then you can't cardiovert them right away. You gotta admit them to the hospital, start on blood thinners. You gotta look at, at the heart with an echocardiogram or a transesophageal echo in which we go through the esophagus and do ultrasound, make sure there are no clots. If there are no clots, the patient can be cardioverted. And cardioverted means to convert the heart back into a normal sinus rhythm. And this can be accomplished in a series of ways. There's medications to keep the heart rate slow, and most of the time that can result in spontaneous cardioversion, something I routinely do in the emergency department if I'm trying to cardiovert a patient, is to start them on a procanamide drip. I do this in a big bag, one liter, I give one gram, and I run over an hour, and more than 50% of the time, the patient will convert to sinus rhythm using this skull uh, chemical cardioversion. But there's also other medications to cardiovert that the cardiologist can use while you're in the hospital. And uh, if those medications don't work or if there's any reason why we can't do this, you can be sedated, usually in the cath lab, but it can be done in the emergency department. And then we zap your heart back into rhythm. We put the paddles on, we give a low current electricity as a zap to convert the rhythm back to sinus. Again, this is if we if it's new onset and we know when it happened, less than 48 hours, if you're in good health, meaning you can withstand sedation in the emergency department and you have no prior history because what happens if you have a prior history, sure, we can cardiovert you in the ER, but the likelihood you'll go back into AFib is pretty high. So, so whether or not we send you to the home or admit you to the hospital for observation or put you on medications to prevent recurrence of the atrial fibrillation, that's up to consultations with cardiology and many other factors which we're not going to discuss here. The other reason to have a fast irregular rhythm would be something called atrial flutter. And atrial flutter is very much like a fib and for all practical purposes treated the exact same way, except on atrial flutter, the heart actually has some contraction, but it's faster than the ventricle. Like that. Usually three to one, four to one, sometimes irregular, so three, two to one, five to one. So what you see is a seesaw pattern, like a whole bunch of contractions followed by a bigger contraction of the ventricle. So you, you can you actually have discernible atrial contractions. In atrial fibrillation, when you do an electrocardiogram, you have this little tiny wave of fibrillation versus atrial flutter, you have actual flutter waves or seesaw. And then, of course, you have the ventricular tachycardias, which is outside the scope of this video. Some other sinus arrhythm, uh, arrhythmias and wandering pacemakers and others like that. But let's go back to the atrial fibrillation since that was the initial question. What is the difference between tachycardia and atrial fibrillation? And the answer is that atrial fibrillation is a form of tachycardia. Uh, there are many other kinds, but atrial fibrillation is one of those, as we explained before. If you're a patient who suffers from atrial fibrillation, then it's important that you control the risk factors and things that can lead you to have atrial fibrillation. And worldwide, the number one reason for atrial fibrillation is something called holiday heart. Somebody goes out in a binging uh, streak of alcohol, maybe just a weekend, they had some fun. Monday morning they wake up and their heart's going crazy and fast and irregular. That's the number one reason. Number two is usually valvular heart problems, problems with the valves of the heart that lead to chronic strain of the atrium, leading to too much fluid there and it becomes irritable, sends the patient to AFib. Of course, problems with electrolytes, problems with thyroid, like hyperthyroidism can also lead to atrial fibrillation. And those are kind of the major ones. But how can you avoid first getting atrial fibrillation or prevent recurrence of the atrial fibrillation? It is very important that you, one, control your blood pressure. That if you are on medication for blood pressure, you're taking, you're complying. If you're on any medicine for heart rate control, you take those as those will keep you from going back into AFib. And we talk about the number one reason for atrial fibrillation being alcohol. So not drinking alcohol also can cause you to have less likelihood of going back into AFib. Cutting down on caffeine or any kind of cardiac stimulant will also result in lower risk of AFib. Uh, getting treatment for your thyroid gland because as discussed, uh, thyroiditis or hyperthyroidism can lead to AFib. Getting regular exercise, and this is kind of a theme that goes in my videos, is being healthy is so important in all aspects of your health. So losing weight, 
getting regular exercise, reducing the stress in your lifestyle can all result in less likelihood of you having atrial fibrillation. So let's talk about the symptoms of atrial fibrillation. And some people present to the ER with a fast heart rate of the 120s and have absolutely no symptoms. Some people have in the heart rate 110s and they feel lightheaded, they feel dizzy, they just don't feel well. But the most common symptoms are feeling like your heart is racing or skipping beats or like the heart is out of sync. Some mild chest pain or tightness, feeling of lightheadedness, dizziness, or feeling like you're gonna pass out, having trouble breathing, especially with exercise. Is there a test for atrial fibrillation? Of course, if the doctor thinks you have atrial fibrillation, he will perform an EKG, an electrocardiogram, which is basically a tracing of the electrical conduction of your heart. And when we look at that paper with the electrical conduction, then we can see the pattern of the heartbeat, the pattern of the atrial contractions to the ventricle contractions. And if we're thinking on AFib, no atrial contractions and multiple irregular ventricular contractions. So how is atrial fibrillation treated? Where emergently heart rate control. We give medicines like calcium channel blockers and beta blockers to bring the heart rate down. Long term is cardioversion. So we give medications to cardiovert, or we give electricity, or we send to an electrophysiologist who can then do surgery and lasers to kind of counteract or treat the arrhythmia, uh, possibly the etiology, the causing agent of these arrhythmias. The other part of the treatment is that if we cannot cardiovert you, or it's gonna take a little while to cardiovert you, we need to thin your blood out. And it used to be anybody with AFib will have to get heparin, which is an IV blood thinner. And it was a problem because we have to do blood tests every couple of hours, we gotta bridge you to oral medicine. Then the Lovenox came in, and those are injections you give twice a day or once a day. Nice, because you don't have to check levels on it, but bad because it's injections. And then the newer anticoagulations came along, Pradaxa and Eloquist, which require no blood levels, and they almost immediately work at thinning the blood out. So now you lose the need for admission to a hospital unless there's other comorbidities, other factors related to why we would have to keep you in the hospital. And then some atrial fibrillations are not fast. Once you start a medication stuff, it might be too slow. So sometimes people require a pacemaker to override the atrium, which is going crazy, and send the appropriate signals to the ventricle to contract. So even though most atrial fibrillation is fast, some are slow atrial fibrillations and might need a pacemaker so that we can override and treat that. If you have atrial fibrillation, what will your life be like? Well, most people with atrial fibrillation live totally normal lives still. It's important that you take your medications as your doctor prescribes and don't change them. There's a lot of people who stop taking them and then they come in with a recurrence of it. And, or they stop taking the blood thinners, they get a blood clot and they can get a stroke, a pulmonary embolism, an arterial embolism, and that's really bad too. Uh, it's important that you learn the signs of strokes, the signs of pulmonary embolism, the signs of arterial embolism, so that if you have any of those symptoms, you seek emergency attention for atrial fibrillation. So I hope this video was useful as to defining what's a normal heart rate, what is tachycardia, what is bradycardia, that there are many different kinds of tachycardias and atrial fibrillation is just one of them. And if you have atrial fibrillation, or you, then it's important to do risk factor modification to prevent recurrence. We talk about alcohol, medications that, or food and drinks that stimulate your heart, checking your thyroid, uh, living healthy, losing weight. And then of course, taking your medications, usually calcium channel blockers, beta blockers. If you're still in AFib, then blood thinners and the risks associated with it. I hope you learned a lot in this video. Please comment send suggestions, send questions at carloaller at gmail.com and I'd love to put a video out to explain this for you. Take care. Bye-bye.